13, verse 5. And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Move to verse 13. Now when Paul and his party set, seal, set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And then, if you will, 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 11, we included this in our text last week as we talked about loneliness. The Apostle Paul writes, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Finding your way through failure. I read about a troubled man who went to a wise rabbi and he said while writhing or wringing out his hands, I'm a failure. More than half the time, I do not succeed at what I must do. Please say something wise. And so the wise rabbi thought for a moment and then he said, my son, I give you this wisdom. Go look on page 930 of the New York Times Almanac for the year 1970, and you'll find the peace of mind you're looking for. Well, the man did as the wise rabbi had instructed, and this is what he found. Ty Cobb, the greatest hitter of all, had a lifetime batting average of 367. The man went back to the rabbi and said, Ty Cobb? Batted 367 in his lifetime. That's all you've got for me? That's it? That's the wise word you have for me? And the rabbi responded, that is it. Ty Cobb got one hit out of every three times he went to bat. He failed twice as much as he succeeded. So, the rabbi said, just what do you expect anyway? I read that and I thought, that's a good question. What is it that we expect in life? Do we expect to always be perfect? Perhaps we would do well to remember this morning that failure is a part of life. It came with the fall of man. We all fail more than we succeed. But here's the problem. Many let failure define their lives. Now here's a key point, a key word. You need to write it down in your heart and in your mind. You need to write it down on a piece of paper if you can because this is important. Sit up a little straighter, listen a little carefully. What I've got to say right now is very important. If you miss everything else I say today, you need to take this hope. Here it is. Failure is always an event. It is never a person. Failure is always an event. It is never a person. You can never be a failure. Now you can fail but you can never be a failure. It is always an event, but never a person. Now with that in mind, I take you to our text this morning. I'm going to talk about John Mark. He found his way through failure. Now Mark and his family were probably Hellenist Jews that means they were Greek-speaking Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem, gained wealth through their lifetime, probably came back into Jerusalem to retire. John is his Jewish name. Mark is his Greek or Roman name. When we first meet John Mark, 
He's a young single adult living at home in Jerusalem with his widowed mother. She was apparently a woman of wealth because she had a large home. And upstairs of that home is a wonderful place in the life of Jesus and the disciples. The scriptures call that upstairs area the upper room. This is the place where Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples on the night he was arrested. After the ascension, this house became the center <clears throat> of Christian activity for the disciples in Jerusalem. It's the place where the Holy Spirit came into the lives of believers. It's the place where the church was born. Also, we learn from Acts chapter 12. When Peter was freed from prison, he went to this place and he found the church on their knees praying that he would find some way, somehow be released. This was a very special house. This was a very special place. No doubt John Mark saw some wonderful things in his home. He was exposed to the essentials of Christianity. His faith became deeply rooted and it grew. He was also a young man of very capable skill. It is no surprise then that Paul and Barnabas chose John Mark to accompany them on the first missionary journey. Acts chapter 13 verse 5 says John Mark was, this, was their assistant. He was the assistant pastor. Scholars believe that John Mark made travel and food arrangements, probably helped or assisted with baptism. Paul and Barnabas had high hopes for John Mark. And this missionary journey began with great success on the island of Cyprus. But when they came to the next stop, the place the scriptures call Perga, John Mark quit, and he went home. I point you again to verse 13. And when Paul and his party set sail for Paphos, look at the last part, departing from them, he returned home. That word departing there is a very interesting word. The Amplified Bible says, he separated himself from them. The Phillips translation says he left them. The message says that is where John called it quits and went home. But that word there speaks of a serious action. It literally means a breach of commitment. It added extra burden upon Paul and Barnabas. He broke his commitment to God. He broke his commitment to Paul and Barnabas. And he went home. He failed. He failed God. He failed Paul. He failed Barnabas. He was a quitter. And things got so bitter that Paul refused to let John Mark go on the second missionary journey. Now, what can we learn from the failure of John Mark to help us find our way through failure? Now, let me say this before I get into the outline. Only those who have failed greatly will be greatly moved through this message. If you fall, if you failed in a small way, you may be interested you may be moved by this message, but if you have failed in a great way, this message can greatly impact your life and perhaps even transform your life. I hope you hear it. I hope you heed what I say today. The first thing that will be in the outline this morning is the reason for his failure. You see, the first question that I ask upon reading the text is why? Why did he go home? Why did this young man, so full of, 
of faith, so rooted in his faith, so much potential for God and for ministry. Why did he just quit and go home? And these are the reasons I came up with. First of all, because of his situation. Mark was a long way from home. The circumstances were unpleasant. The uncertainty of the road that he traveled was frightening. He probably had heard those horror stories about robbers hiding in the narrow mountain passes. He'd probably heard about the beatings of many. He probably heard about people being hurt and things being stolen and he just in fear wanted to go home where he felt safe and secure. You know, there are a lot of people today who fail because they're afraid. Life looks dark and uncertain. There are many threats. So rather than facing the threats with faith, they go home where it is secure and safe. They, will, they refuse to take the necessary risk to serve the Lord. Perhaps that's what John did. He went home because of the dangerous circumstances. Perhaps he was just afraid. Also, I would suggest he went home or he failed God because of the shelter. He was homesick. Keep in mind, his home was a special place. He had witnessed all kinds of great movements of God in his home. People were getting saved. There was always joy in his home. There was always a celebration going on in his home. But more than even that, Mama was there. And many scholars suggest that John Mark just got homesick and he wanted to go and see his mother, little Jimmy returned home from summer camp and his parents asked him if he got homesick and he replied, not me. But some of the kids did that had dogs. <laughs> you know, we don't like to admit we get homesick, do we? That's, that's, that's not being a, a big boy. We don't like to admit that we're getting homesick. But friends, all of us long for the way things used to be. And perhaps it was because of his shelter. There are a lot of people today who fail because they refuse to leave home. Did you know that? They refuse to leave the security and dependence of their parents. Sometimes parents are to blame too because they don't want their children to leave. I remember when I left home for the last time at the age of 19. I had my little church that just called me to be their pastor. My first sermon was eight minutes. That's right. Little group met in the back of the church for a while. I sat out on the front pew of the church, and in a minute they came back and said, Brother Matt, we want you to be our pastor. I didn't know what I was doing. But they were so loving and patient. I kidded everybody saying it was the eight-minute sermon that did it. But when I left home that day, going off to the college near my little church, I put everything I knew to take in that, little, in that car and st also put an air conditioner that we needed in a little apartment that I was going to be staying in. It couldn't even shut the trunk. We had to tie it down, and I headed out. My mother tells the story that she watched my car until the, she could no longer see the taillights, and then she said she cried the rest of the day. Saying goodbye is not easy, is it? It is common to get homesick. Perhaps that's what happened to John Mark. Well, next, perhaps Mark failed because of satisfaction. Maybe he thought he had done enough. After all, he had been part of the great success on the island of Patma or Cyprus. And many lives had been touched and a lot of Lives have been changed, and maybe he thought, I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to step up now. And so in satisfaction with what he'd already done, he went home. You know, there are a lot of people like that today. They start off like a rocket. 
but they fizzle out. They come to believe that they've done enough. They've done their part. They're satisfied, and so they go to the sideline expecting somebody else to do what they should be doing. Friend, doing nothing can be the greatest failure of all. But then finally, perhaps Mark failed because of spite. You know, as this story unfolds, there is a, there is a subtle shift that takes place in the book of Acts. The biblical writer up to this place speaks of Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul. But now there's this subtle change and the writer of Acts, Dr. Luke, starts talking about Paul and Barnabas. What has happened? Well, many scholars believe that at this point Paul has taken over the leadership of the team. From Barnabas. And perhaps it made Mark angry. You see, Mark was Barnabas' nephew. And perhaps he felt Paul had forced his way in, took over the team, and it angered Mark. And so John Mark went home in spite. There are some today who quit on God because of spite. Did you know that? There are some who get their feelings hurt. And so they quit. Someone gets a position in the church that they felt like they wanted and deserved, and so they quit. Someone gets more praise than them, and so they quit. It's like a slow burn, and then it erupts. If that's the way they're going to be down there at the church, I'm just going to quit. So there are many even today who quit because of spite. Now, friend, I want you to know in this first point that failure comes for many reasons, but perhaps for John Mark, it was because, first of all, he was, it was a situation that caused him great fear, or perhaps he was homesick. He wanted to go back home to his mother and all the security of his mother's home, or maybe it was satisfaction with what he'd already accomplished, or maybe it was even spite against the Apostle Paul for what he did to his uncle. Now, before we condemn John Mark, let me remind you that our church roles are filled with people who have quit on God. John Mark's not the first person, nor the last person, to quit on God. They've had their initial experience with Christ, but for some reason, and at some point, they quit. They said, I'm done. They quit on God. One of the biggest mock boxing matches of the 20th century took place November the 24th, 1980, in the Superdome there in New Orleans, Louisiana. It was a rematch between Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran. Duran had won the previous fight and was favored to win the second. He had a record of 72 wins, one loss. He had won his last 41 fights. He was on a winning streak. The rematch was close. Only a point or two separated the two fighters on the judges' scorecards. But during the, the eighth round, something unthinkable happened. Roberto Duran turned to the referee and spoke two life-changing words. He said, no mas, which translated into English means no more. He quit. He wasn't injured. He wasn't cut. He was just frustrated, and so he quit. Now here's a fighter who was one of the best to ever step into the ring. He had won all those previous fights. But now when you mention his name, what comes to mind is that phrase. No moss. No more. People remember he quit. Perhaps today. We need to remember that that's what people will remember about us. No moss. He quit. 
Maybe we quit because we're afraid. Maybe we quit because we're homesick. Maybe we, we, uh, oh, we need the security and the shelter of, of familiarity. Or maybe we're just satisfied with what we've done. Or maybe we're doing it despite someone who's hurt us. But unfortunately, what people remember about us is no moss, no more. I quit. I quit. Now, we move from the reason that John Mark quit to the recovery. You see, I'm thankful that I can stand up before you today and say this is not the end of John Mark's story. The young man of faith, the young man who had so much potential to serve God, he did go home. He bailed out on God. He bailed out on his fellow workers. But the good news is that's not the end of the story. He went back home. He refocused his life. He overcame the obvious criticisms from the believer family uh, called Christians. He proved himself to be a very capable and powerful Christian minister. There are two very clear uh, ways we can tell that his life changed. I read for you one of those in 2 Timothy where John Mark say, or Paul says to Timothy, Get John Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. I don't know when it happened, but somewhere along the way, Paul and John Mark reconciled. And Paul recognized his value in ministry. But there's another way that we recognize that Paul, uh, John Mark's life changed. That he made his way through failure. You know how it is? It's that gospel. It's that gospel that bears his name. It's, it's the gospel called Mark. Did you know that's the first gospel that was written? I know it's second in the New Testament, but it's the first one that was written. And did you know the source, the main source of John Mark's understanding of the gospel and written there, his source was Peter. Peter himself. A great testimony of making your way through failure. Oh no, failure's not the end of the story for John Mark. Winston Churchill said, success is never final. Failure is never fatal. I read about a young man named, a young man named Harry. He was from Missouri. And as a child, he gave evidence of brilliance on the piano. In addition to being very gifted, he was also very disciplined. Even as a child, he would get up at 5 a.m. in the morning and practice his piano. And under the tutelage of Mrs. C.E. White, he had the hope of reaching great success. At the age of 15, Mrs. White brought news that the great pianist uh, Paderewski was coming to town and the young man was thrilled because he followed this great pianist and Mrs. White took him to the concert and after it was over introduced him to the great pianist. And Harry said to him, I play your minuet, but there is part of the minuet that I really don't understand. And the great Pianist Paderewski took him out on the stage, sat him down, listened to him play. He looked over at Mrs. White and he nodded in approval. Oh, things look great for Harry. But listen to this. The door closed. Harry's father lost everything in the Kansas City grain market. Harry had to go to work and his dreams of being a great concert pianist were shattered but the young man did not give up. He didn't let that closed door stop him. He became world famous, not as a pianist, but as a president of the United States of America. His name was Harry S. Truman. You see, failure doesn't have to end your story. You can find your way through it. Have you failed at something? Have you failed in your responsibility as a father? 
Have you failed in your responsibility as a mother? Have you failed in your responsibility as a wife or a husband? Have you failed in your work? Have you failed in your school? Have you failed in a relationship? Have you failed in any area of your life? Join the crowd. Join the crowd. Theodore Roosevelt said, the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. All of us have failed at something. Hey, listen, we've probably failed more than we have succeeded. But here's the good news. We can work our way through it. Take a moment. Put your hand right here. Check your pulse. Do you have one? If you got one, I got good news. You can work your way through your failure. Now you preacher, you're saying, how can I do that? What can I do? Let me give you some very practical steps to take before I'm through. First of all, learn from your failure. Ask yourself the right question. What caused me to fail? Was it something I said? Was it something I did? Was it an unhealthy attitude that I had? What caused me to fail? Was I not prepared? Did I not have the life skill? What was my problem? Why did I fail? It is said that Edison consoled a colleague who was discouraged over the many inventions he had that did not work. And Edison replied, We have not or we have learned something. The friend said, I've discovered nothing from these inventions. And Edison said, we've learned something. The thing can't be done that way, so we must try another way. So my first point is go to school with your failure. Learn from it. Abraham Lincoln said, my great concern is not whether you failed, but whether you are content with your failure. Henry Ford, did you know he went bankrupt five times before he succeeded? This is what he said about failure. It's the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Never be content with your failure. The first thing is learn from it. Learn from it. Number two, let it go. Let go of it. You see, after you've learned from it, then you need to let it go. Don't let the feelings of failure linger in your mind and in your spirit. Accept the fact that you have failed and there's nothing you can do about it. You certainly can't go back and do it again. So let it go. Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots. I've lost more than 300 games. I failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I have succeeded. You see, first of all, you learn from it, then you let it go. And thirdly, you need to live above it. Put that failure into proper perspective. Let it launch you into a higher level of commitment. Do what you can to make your failure a positive in your life. A football coach gave this advice on how to deal with failure. When they run you out of town, get out in front and make it look like you're leading the parade. <laughs> Do what you can to make it a positive in your life. Sports Illustrated did an article about Chris Parker. He had just received a scholarship to play football at Marshall University. He wanted to show his girlfriend his new school. So he and his girlfriend, along with her two sisters and brother, got into his sports car and headed toward Marshall University. On the return trip, they ran into the side of a bridge Chris's girlfriend and two sisters were killed. Only the two boys came out alive. What seemed to be the greatest tragedy of his life turned out to be the greatest motivation of his life. This is what he said. Whenever I face difficult situations, I think nothing can be a 
harder, greater burden than this. The event motivates me in another way, he said. I think of how I've survived, and it makes me want to do something great with my life. You see, failure, although difficult and tragic, can inspire us to greatness. We need to live above it. A teenager brought home a bad report card, mostly D's and F's. The father said, son, what do you have to say for yourself? And the boy said, well, dad, it's one thing for sure. I ain't cheating. <laughs> Listen, friend. When we fall, we need to learn from it. We need to let it go. And we need to live above it. Now, there's one final thing to be done. To work our way through failure. You see the suggestions that I've given you today. You will find them. In any secular psychologist counseling session. They'll give you those three things. But you see there's one more. And I believe it's for the Christian. This is a gift that Jesus has given to us. That we need to claim for ourselves. And it's for the Christian. And here it is. We need to lean on Jesus. The psalmist, chapter 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Listen to me, friend. I want you to understand the real hero of Mark's story is not Mark. The real hero of Mark's story is Jesus. Jesus. He believed in Mark. He was there for Mark. He was there when nobody else was there for Mark. He was there when all the other brothers and sisters in Christ were looking at him through suspicious eyes. Jesus was there for him. Jesus enabled him to overcome. You have heard probably... Something like a winner is one who gets up when he gets knocked down. I would like to suggest this. A winner is one who gets up when he can't. He's a, he, he gets up when he can't because he's got an enabler. He's got a friend and his name is Jesus. He's within us. He's with us, and he enables us to get up when we can't. That's why we've got to lean on Jesus. Colbert and Joyce Croft, and I'm going to close with this. We're going through a great storm. One desperate evening, they got down on their knees. And in discouragement and in their brokenness and in their tears... Colbert prayed, God, will you make a way? Everybody's telling me that there is no way, but God, will you make a way? About one o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking to them on the water of their storm. And Colbert picked up a pen and paper, and he began to write, the words to a song. He wrote, I thought number one would surely be me. I thought I could be what I wanted to be. I thought I could build on life's sinking sand. But I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Can't even walk without you holding my hand. Mountains too high and the valleys too wide. Down on my knees I've learned to stand. And I can't even walk without you holding my hand.
hand. Have you learned that? Have you learned that? Friend, we've got to learn to lean on Jesus. In the brokenness of failure, we've got to lean on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. Thank you for the story of John Mark that helps us make our way through failure. We're thankful that his failure was not the end of his story. And I pray, Father, that all of us will recognize and realize today that when we suffer a failure in our lives, it's not the end. It doesn't have to be the end. And it certainly doesn't have to identify us as a person. Because failure is always an event, not a person. May we understand that no matter what's happened in our lives, no matter what we've experienced, no matter what, for what reason, we can start again. Help us to follow the principles that we've stated today. And most of all, help us just to look to you. Help us to lean on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Now our heads are bowed and eyes are closed.